But I have a word of the Lord for you today. I'm, I'm in the second installment of this series of Emmanuel. Emmanuel is a much uh, maligned and misunderstood uh, concept in Scripture. We just think it's a name. It's another name for Jesus, um, um, Yeshua Emmanuel. Um, if you read the name in Scripture, you notice it's spelled two different ways, and you wonder which one is right. They both are. Um, in the Hebrew, uh, the, when it's translated, Hebrew reads from right to left. It begins with a, a, a silent ornament. That's why I call it a Hebrew. And the first letter is translates to our I. But in the Greek, it reads from left to right, and the first letter is the epsilon or the E. And so it's Emmanuel in the Greek and Emmanuel in the Hebrew. You heard the Lord, now you can go home. And no, I'm kidding. See, so you already, you already got a revelation that you didn't know before. But the good thing about this is what I want to share with you is that it has purpose in our lives. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and he says to them this statement. He says, for a great and effectual door is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. Many adversaries, many things blocking the way. When you hear this, this teaching on Emmanuel, it is not a name, a, a Christmas message. It's a warfare message. Everything that God gives to you, everything that God schedules for you will be met with adversaries. There will be resistance. It's a part of it. Warfare is not just something we talk about. It's something you're engaged in. There are things happening in your life right now that you think is just struggle, personal struggle. People don't like you. It's warfare. The Apostle Paul told the church in Ephesus, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. If you were to see, if God were to roll back the heavens and allow you to see into the other dimension, not, the, not, the other, or not into heaven, but the other dimension in this room, you'd be surprised to know that in this room are people, there are frequencies like airwaves and sound waves, but what you will see are, are so many demons. And the angels of the Lord are standing around the walls, if you could see it, and they're watching. Where do you get that from? It's in the Bible. The angels of God are assigned to us who are the heirs of salvation. When you, when you, you, you Jesus talked about the, the, the guardian angels. He, he said that the angels stand before God, speaking about the children. Do you think your guardian angels um, resigned when you grew up? And he didn't say angel, singular. We say like there's one angel assigned to a person. You don't understand. God has enough. Imagine this. Satan took a third of the angel of heaven, and the Bible calls that number innumerable. So here's my question. What's two-thirds of innumerable? Do you understand the massiveness of your God? Do you understand that, that when, you come, when you leave your home, when you send certain things, all of your faculties, your spiritual faculties, physical faculties, mental faculties, they, they're connected to God and to another realm of which, listen to this, you are a citizen. It's your, it's, your, it's your natural habitat. The earth is not our natural habitat. As a matter of fact, death freaks, it out, freaks us out because death is not natural to us. We weren't designed to die. And so we will never get accustomed to dying. It will always freak you out. It's not normal. In this realm, it's a part of the culture, but in the realm that we're from, it's not even normal. Our God, he's incapable of dying. He's incapable of aging. The Apostle Paul says, now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. And the, so you would know that the, the Romans added the word wise in there because it was not in that original translation. It actually says for the only God. And today I was going to talk to you about American idols and talk to you about how idols are made, but I'm going to save that right before Christmas. That would be a Christmas gift. Today what I want to deal with is this issue of what we have to deal with in, in, in warfare. Now, I need a clock because that, and that, I'm not going to always look over there, but somebody remind me to look at the clock, okay? So if you're in the front row, you could point, just point to the clock so if I get too long, okay? Because we're about to go in on this. Right. Now, your, your faith needs knowledge. You need to know how to do what you do. And when I'm teaching, you can talk back to me because it really helps me to know that you're there because I can't see your face. Yes, Understand this. Your faith, the problem right now between you 
accomplishing what God called you to do, going to the future that God prepared for you and where you are right now. The problem is knowledge. You don't have knowledge. And if you have knowledge, you don't know how to use it. So the problem becomes another dimension of knowledge called wisdom. You don't even know. Now, understand this. Make a note of this. Wisdom answers the question. My, my ministry is to take hard things and make them simple. I have, God has given me the, the gift of simplification. Now, so what is wisdom? Wisdom answers the question what to do, when to do it, where to do it, how to do it, and in many cases with whom. You notice I didn't say why. Because many times God will not give you the why until you engage yourself in what he called you to do. So wisdom speaks of what to do, when to do it, where to do it, how to do it, and with whom. And the with whom is critical because sometimes, watch this now, the adversary that's in your way will invite themselves into your circle so they could block you from within. There are people who are signed against your progress, and some of us are, are ignorant enough to date them. And deceived enough to, well, to marry them. If you're dating a problem, don't marry it. Okay, let's go forward. So, we, start, we started... We started on last week with, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse 1. I want to read that again. I'm going to do a quick review, then we'll go forward. It says this in Deuteronomy 20, verse 1. When you go out to fight your enemies and you face horses and chariots and an army greater than your own, here's what he says. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. He says, the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt is with you. He is with you. And then it's in verse 2, when you prepare for battle. Now, you have to understand this. Moses is speaking to a people who are a warrior class people. And he's he's instructing them how to go to war, how to face their enemies. I told you on last week, the order was they will align the armies in ranks, a massive force, and they will bring the priest out dressed in his garb. His, his garb was called the beauty of holiness. Whenever you see the term the beauty of holiness in the Psalms, it's not talking about a, a way to worship God. It's talking about what the priest is wearing. The priest's garments were called the beauty of holiness. And he will come out before the people with the stones on his chest representing the tribes of Israel. And everything about his garment says something about, about God and his relationship to his people. God has given the name, listen to this, Jehovah Elohim Sabah the Lord God of heaven's hosts, or the Lord God of the armies, and he becomes the commanding general of his army. And the reason that God has to get involved in the fight is because, watch this, we're fighting the battle in the earth, but the real battle is being waged in the heavenlies. By the time the battle, watch this now, by the time the Lord, matter of fact, I'm going to take a step backwards. By the time you were born, that by the time you were conceived, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. And I've ordained you or set you in an order so that you can do certain things. Now, I want to speak to this word. I'm, I will repeat myself until you get it. The word ordain is not a ministry word. The word ordain is not a church word. The word ordain is an order word. It's an organization word. In the, it, when, you, when, you study, when you study ordination, the root word is order. In, 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 the, in the realm of ordination, there is, watch this, there's order in the center, there's ordinary on the left, and there's ordination on the right. Let me say it again. In the center, there's order. Everybody say order. order. There's order. So, so whenever you're part of anything, if you want it to function, you need order. Now, by virtue of the order... When you come into the space to do what God called you to do, there will be people who will be considered ordinary. What does it mean? They have no part in what you're doing right now. Ordinary means they have no part in what you're doing right now. It does not mean they're not valuable. It does not mean they're not necessary. It means that according to the definition of God, for what God wants to do now, that person... They're qualified as ordinary for now. 
In that same context of order, which is the system that does what God wants to do, on the other side of that is ordination. What does it mean? That God has marked people to do certain things. He will bring people and he'll say, your assignment is to build up and to, or to tear down and to build up. Why? Because if we're going to build something that's going to last, then he needs people who are experts at demolition and experts at construction, and they have to know what, watch this, the problem in church, what we have done, I feel the Lord, the problem, what we have done is we try to make everybody the same. So people are bothered because, no, no, I'm going to tell you, I, and I have to learn, I was telling them this morning when we were coming out that, you know, back in the day, uh, uh, James made a joke with me about, about preaching and, and grabbing your, what do you call it, the air tug? I used to do that. I, I want to tell you a, a funny story. Years ago, everybody said a long time ago. I had, I had an apostle, he was over me, his name was Leon Carr, and, and he let me preach one night in, in church, and man, I was hyped, and I preached from Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and the saints were getting with me. You ever preach and the saints are getting with you? They said, come on, say that. They were, they were throwing stuff at me, man. I started to feel myself. I got down off the, off the platform, got, there was a chair empty, I got up on the chair, and I was caught, ah! listen to me. And the saints were like, preach. And they were, and I was going in and I felt the prayer. I, like, I was saying dumb stuff like I feel God. You know? When I got finished, <laughs> when I got finished, my man of God says to me, everybody was, I mean, they formed a line to greet me, they hugged me. Great word. He pulled me aside. He said, I need to talk to you. He says, here were his words. Don't you ever do that again. That was the worst message I've ever heard in my so, so the devil started whispering in my ear, and the devil tells me, he just jealous. He said to me, here's what he said to me. I know what the devil's telling you. And here's what he said to me. But that's not who you are. He said, if you imitate me, because that's what you are doing. He said, we're going to lose what's you. He said, and in this order, listen, in this order... You're the only teacher we have. You're the purest teacher. What are we going to do if you try to imitate me for the response? And that man of God set me down. He looked me in my face. He says, you are a teacher. Go learn what that means. And what he did, he took the order of God and he moved me. Watch it. As it relates to stirring the people and all that, he made me ordinary. But here's the thing about being ordinary. Until you become ordinary, you never find your ordination. Because you have to be willing to be ordinary to that so you can be ordained to this. And you want to be good at everything. You can't be good at everything. What are you talking about? Listen, we're going, we're going somewhere with this. When you are called to do something for God, there will be adversaries. And so you have to know how to fight. The priest will stand and he said to the people, this is how you're going to go to war. And the first thing he did was, here what he would say, if you are afraid, if you are in fear, go home. Fear is contagious. Whenever there was an issue of fear, the Lord will always amputate and remove. Why would he remove the fearful person? Because when a person is afraid, it can make everyone afraid. When you disagree with something, watch your words. It could just be you can't see it. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want it. It means that you don't understand it. Now, you know, I'll be honest with you. I looked at all nations and I said to my, I told the pastor, I said, I, would, I wouldn't have chose me for this. He said, you're exactly what they need. I'm like, never told me why. But you're, let me tell you why. You cannot be an ignorant army. An ignorant army in the heat of battle What's, what, what, what's this? There be more people dying from friendly fire than anything else. We, when, you, when your brother is, is stirred or your sister's afraid and doesn't know who she are, you don't kill her. You redirect her. You teach her. You instruct her. You encourage her. But we don't kill each other. I'm, I, I, am, I am teaching better than you responding. What about that? We don't muzzle prophets. We don't, listen, you know, uh, um, it's an interesting thing. Do you know that, that the congregation you're a part of can teach you to be afraid? Yes. 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 
The Bible says in Galatians 6 and 1, if, 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 a, if someone is overtaken in the fall, ye which are spiritual, which means that everyone among us don't have that spiritual man, or, or mantle on us. Because a person can shout doesn't mean they're spiritual. Because their gift work doesn't mean they're spiritual. Understand this. He said, if you're spiritual, watch this. If you're spiritual, you restore such a one. Why? Because we're in a battle and every person counts. We're already outnumbered. So watch this. So I've seen people learn your story, use your story against you, and cause you to go into fear and lose access to your gift. There are singers out here right now that's afraid to sing. You know why? Because where you came from, they made you think that because you didn't sing like them, your singing gift was not... Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to? Right? You don't play like them. So you, I remember what they told me. They told me, so, well, I used to play in church. They told me, oh, oh. I literally was in a service. And the bishop turned to me and says, get up off that thing and let someone play who know what they're doing. Now, you have to understand something. I was raised in the club. I could play, but I didn't play the way they played. And you know what they, the thing was? They dismissed me, not as ordinary, but as useless. So the priest stood before the army, and he says to them, there's a way to fight, and you have to know to fight. He says, listen, he says, don't be afraid when you face the enemy. We'll talk about fear in a minute. But he says, know this, the Lord, of, the Lord your God who brought you out, he is with you. Yes. Everybody say, God is with me. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he, of course, the, the instructions are given. And in verse 4, he says, for the Lord your God is going with you. He will fight for you. He will, he's going with you. He will fight for you. He's going with you. He will fight for you. He's going with you. He will fight. He's going with you. He will fight. He's going with you, and he's going to fight. The problem is when the battle stirs, you don't trust God to fight for you. God will use you to lure the enemy into a compromising position so that he could cut him off. When my kids were growing up, there's a statement we always said around the house. When, when something will go wrong, we will say, the devil always overplays his hand. The devil always overplays his hand. Say that out loud. The devil always, out loud. The devil, he all, and God, when, whenever a situation is happening, it seems like God is not doing anything, it's because God is baiting the devil into a trap. Pharaohs don't drown themselves. They're too smart. So what God will do, he will bait them. He will, he will lead you by a way that seems improbable and impossible just to bait Pharaoh into a trap. He will have you use your authority to open a way and you think it's a way of escape and Pharaoh is following you. You're wondering, well, why do you send me this way if you're going to follow me too? Because God is baiting Pharaoh into a trap. And right before God does the greatest thing in your life, Rodney, it's terrifying. Because God sees what you don't see, and God knows what you don't know, and sometimes he'll tell you to do things, and you say, I don't have the money. Let me tell you something that's important for you to know. When God, give, when God ordains you to something, now I use the word ordination with this. Ordination means that God has put his hand on you for that thing. When God ordains you to something, especially something that's marketplace, something that, that is that's a pioneering, you never have the proper resources. If you're waiting for the money to do what God told you to do, you would be forever waiting. God is not obligated to give you anything until you obey him. There is a thing called beginning grace. In beginning, all beginning grace is, is, the, is just the, the mindset to even receive what God is saying. Everybody said beginning grace. In, in beginning grace, God gives you the, the wherewithal to just trust him. But here's the thing, you, have, you don't have the money. You don't have the connections, you don't have the people. But when you begin to go out on 
beginning grace, then you get to a certain place, God gives you a thing called continuing grace. It's, it's in the continuing grace phase where resources start finding you. Just when you're about to give out a gas, God sends someone to help you along. Watch this now. But continuing grace is not as powerful as finishing grace. There is a finishing grace. And what finishing grace does for you, is you get to a certain point where you're doing all God told you to do, and the thing you built is bigger than you. The gift that you've developed is putting you on a platform. Have you ever been put on a platform that your gift opened the door for, but your heart is terrified? Ever happened to you that your, that your gifting, that God, your, the anointing on your life got you into a door, and when you saw the place, you freaked out? You need finishing grace, because the bottom line is that's, that's the goal of God. God, listen to this quickly. God always wants to get you in a position where there's an element of impossibility. The element of impossibility causes you or forces you to need him. If you can do it without God, he didn't call you to it. So the two common challenges that you're going to have when you're facing or fighting for your future or doing warfare for the promise that, uh, that has been given to you. Now, you know what's interesting about this is you say, Pastor, what does this have to do with uh, Emmanuel? We're going to get to that name in a minute again. I'm going to keep revisiting it. Everything that God says is for a reason. Here's what the Lord says concerning Jesus. He told Joseph, he says, Mary's going to give birth to a son. You're going to name him Jesus but they're going to call him Emmanuel. All of Israel knew what Emmanuel meant. It's being interpreted God with us or with us is God. And I said last week that it was a war cry before it became a proper name. So what's a war cry? A war cry is a call to arms. It's a, it's a sound released to stir soldiers for battle. It's the last thing a soldier says before he faces the fight. Can I ask you a question? What's your self-talk like before the battle starts? I had a lady, um, she used to run my outreach in Dothan and she, the doc doctor called her in and said, we did your blood work, you have cancer. And he says, we're gonna start you on rounds of chemo. He started giving them, and she stopped and she looked at him and she said, before you give me a treatment plan, let me go home and think about this. He said, what's to think about? He said, we need to get ahead of it. And she's like, no, I need to, I need to pray this through. She called me. She said, I need, you, I need to meet you. She sat down. She told me. She said, the doctor says I have, I have cancer. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. She said, stop. I just need you to hear me. It's okay. She said, I'm not going to take the chemo. I said, you know, I recommend you listen to the doctor. She said, Here's what she said to me. You have been teaching me faith for seven years. Now I'm in a faith fight. I'm going to need my instructor to man up. She went back to the doctors. Here's what she said. Document what I'm telling you. She said, because you're going to see the hand of God. Now here's the thing. She had in her heart to start a ministry for people who came out of prison to get a fresh start. Didn't know where she was going to get the money from. Long and short of it, she gets into this, into this battle with cancer, cut all her hair off. I was watching her praying, saying, God, give her some sense so she could take this chemo. God, I was, I would preach messages, God could use medicine too. I mean, I just try to help the sister out. <laughs> Here's the thing. She ends up beating this cancer. All she was doing was going back to get checked. Took none of the stuff they were giving her. When the doctor saw her chart, they said to her, this is impossible. She said, what do you see? They, this first thing they said was, it's shrinking. And here's what she told him. She said, you have not seen anything yet. She was feeling horrible. But she kept standing. And she kept testifying, she kept talking, and she kept working towards what God called her to do. She went in one day, the doctor says, 
another doctor comes in, they stand in there, he says, I want to show you something. He flips the chart around. He said, this is you when you came in, so you know we're not lying. This is you. This is you today. And here's what, here's what the doctor said. We have never seen anything like this. It is a miracle. You know what she did? She said, I need a favor from you. She said, God put something in my heart to do, and she told him about her thing. You know what those doctors did? They opened their checkbooks right then and there, and they started, they, <laughs> they started writing checks, and the, and the doctors and their friends financed the ministry God put in her heart, because you know what they knew? They knew that God was with her. Sometimes, now, now listen, listen, I, I don't want God to try me like, no, don't do that, I, I, but, but, but sometimes, sometimes God will allow you to go through a difficult situation just to prove to people that you're not alone. You see, it's one thing to talk about God. It's another thing for God to show people that you're not by yourself. The two things you're going to face when you fight for your future, when you're doing warfare for your promise, are fear and dismay. I told you about fear. Now, last week I was saying the word yare, and some of you thought I was saying Yahweh. Let me spell it for you. The, the Hebrew word for fear, Y-A-R-E, yare, it literally means to have too much respect for a thing. Fear comes into your heart when you respect something more than you respect God. When you give it more weight than you give to God. When people hear cancer, they shudder. If they just say, it's just a cold, ah, oh, I recover from a cold. But cancer, oh, that'll kill a whole lot of people. And what you have done is you have promoted cancer to the realm of a God. No, 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 no. Can I, can I take a step further with this? Our idolatry, I'm going to talk about it next week. Our idolatry is out of control. The church has turned ministry gifts into gods. I was standing in the, in, the, in the doorway of my studio uh, at the ranch, and the Spirit of God showed me a flash, a flash of a vision. And in the vision, here's what I saw. I saw people, four people on a serving line. You ever been to a restaurant, and when you come in, you, you, uh, there's meats, and there's starches, and there's vegetables, and there's desserts, and they have four people at least on the line? And the Lord showed me a serving line, and all of the people in line coming through, and he says, this is your church. You know what the Lord showed me? He showed me the, the, the servers behind the serving line, not just serving their item, but telling the people, you don't need anything but this right here. This is the meat. This is the, this is the best part of the meal. You don't need the other stuff. You need this. And the people who are strong enough to say, no, I, I think I need some starch. They go to starch, and they say, oh, you don't need the meat. Give them back the meat. You just need the starch. And the people who are serving the vegetables say, you know what? Meat and starch are bad for you. All you need are the veggies. And then you have the people down here at the dessert saying, you know what? No, no. Oh, this is sweet. It tastes better than all that. This is, this is good for your sweet tooth. I mean, you'll feel much better. It's comfort food. When the only reason that God assigned each person to the service line was to serve what he gave them. Watch this, watch this. What we have done is we have turned what our special gift into idols so that when we go into battle, we don't know what the, our, who our God is, and we turn to our gifts. No, 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 I'm going to tell you right now. I, I see it on social media all the time. Prophetic people need a special place. Let me tell you something. Prophetic people need the word of God. Prophetic people need the word of God. Prophetic people need to humble themselves and be just a, a part of the body and so that God could pour oil on their prophetic gift. Teachers need the word of God. Apostles need the word of God and humility. We all, but what we do is, oh no, if you're not a prophet, you're not, if you're not a teacher, you're not this. If you're, and we have divided and destroyed the army of God so that when we go into battle, we don't even fight together. We say only the prophets can prevail. Prophets can't prevail without apostolic foundation. I ain't get a whole lot of hand clapping there. Okay. I found a spot. I found a spot. Anybody responding there? Good. Let's stay right here. We ain't moving right here. We're going to dig in right here. 
We about to dig in right here. No, no, listen to me. You, someone told you. Someone told you that you could function because your gift is so powerful apart from the rest of the body. What happens when, when, when someone gets you from behind? There's a story in the Bible where David had gotten older and he missed a step. He, he, he lost a step. And the Bible says he was fighting. He had, he's a giant slayer. He was known as a giant slayer. But in that war, in that battle, the, the giant got the better of David. And the Bible says his nephews had to come over and rescue him from the giant. Why? Because here's the thing. Here's the thing. You think that because you ordained to do something that you are in, you're indestructible? You, think, you don't think that you have some kind of uh, vulnerability? I want you to understand something. All of the stuff I'm sharing with you is not stuff that will happen. It's happening now. And the Lord says, you've got to teach my people that when we rally for battle, the battle cry is not prophecy or the title of apostle or teacher. No, the battle cry is Emmanuel. God is with us. Why do you expect to win? Because the Lord is with us. Yes. And I'm going to show you some scripture. 13 minutes, that clock is alive. Okay. <laughs> let, let me show. So, I got to jump over a whole lot of this. L listen to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 8 verse 9. He says, he says, huddle together you nations and be terrified. Here's what he says to them. Listen all you distant, land, distant lands. Prepare for battle. He said, but you will be crushed. He said, yes, prepare for battle, but you will be crushed. In verse 10, he says this, call your councils of war, but they will be worthless. He said, develop your strategies. They will not succeed. Why? For God is with us. In the year that your church came apart, 4,500 other churches closed their doors for good. But somebody in your midst got the memo that men don't start churches upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell the counselor will not prevail against it and someone understood that the enemy can't stop what God started he can't kill what God has given life to. And they took a stand. Can I ask a question? How many times in your experience have you been in a situation that you just quit on because you forgot that God is with you? So here's what I want to do. There's a scripture in the Bible the, the, let me give you some definitions real quick, and I want to repeat those. The word fear, I said to you, is having such mad respect for the giants you're facing that you forget. You forget that they're not gods, and you give them God's status. That's fear. The word dismayed is a powerful word. The word dismayed, it, it means it's a powerful form of discouragement that is triggered by improper focus. Listen to this. The, when you see in the King James, we hardly use the word dismayed today. We just say discouragement. But the reason dismay is greater than discouragement is because what the enemy does, he commandeers your focus. Yeah. He keeps tapping you on the shoulder and saying, look at this. Look at, you can't hardly sleep at night yeah. because your focus is on that thing. You are so, the, the, I've said this to you before, the word worry means to be held in, in a noose or to be choked by a thought. And your focus is on that thing so heavily until you become so discouraged. And watch it. You tell people, I, I think I'm depressed. I don't know. It's not depression. There, there's in between discour just regular discouragement and deep depression is being dismayed. Where your focus is so off. You're focusing on the, the worst possibility. You're focusing on all the things you did wrong. You, 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 you Listen, you got up there. You sung the song. You missed one spot. And that's all you think about. Your mind has been programmed to focus on the negative. All you can see is your failure. There's more to you than the fact that you gained weight over the pandemic. Oh, 
Well, I, I can't do it because I gave. Ain't anybody studying that? It's not what's on you, what's in you. It's not, listen, no, let me help you all out. I'm about to help you all out. Here's the problem with you all, okay? You don't even understand what it means to have the Lord upon you. I, w- I was studying, I was doing some deep study the other day, and it is an interesting concept of the Holy Spirit that the Hebrews teach, and it's weird, but get this, Elder Cortavius. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you to do something, first of all, the Spirit in you is for you, the Spirit on you is for others, right? You know that. The Spirit in you is for you. The Spirit on you is for others. But, but the way the Hebrews see it is so crazy. When the Holy Spirit is on you, they say, here's what they say, they say, you're wearing God. You're clothed in God. But get this, when the Holy Spirit is in you, God is wearing you. God is clothed in you. So God can't do a whole lot of nothing, watch this now, if your mentality is always to focus on what's wrong with you and what's negative and what you can't do, you are limiting the, ho- the Holy One of Israel. God can't get anything done because he has to deal with you. You become the obstacle. You become the opposition to God. And God says, get out of my way. Get out of my way. Somebody shout, move. move. Shout again, say move. move. Get the heck out of the way. Move. Put it in the comments. Move. All in God's way. Like a left-hand driver, like a left-lane driver. Just get out of the way. Just move. I'm ag- Listen, I just got aggravated talking about that. Somebody shout, move. Say, get out of the way. Get the heck out of the way. Your mind is blocking God from doing what he wants to do because he's with you and you act like you're alone. You're not alone. You would have never gotten this far of you by yourself. You are, listen, you are walking on stuff that other folk is drowning in. You are walking on, you, this, I, you say, but it's so much water, but you're walking on it. You survived all this. Folk done died behind you. And you move. Get out the way. Jesus. Okay, sit down. The Lord, one day, <laughs> is what Mark Moore at? <laughs> Mark, you in here? Where Mark? <laughs> So Mark, when I get when I get to a certain place of view in here, I, I'm gonna just throw you the mic. You just just <laughs> so so. I want to show you something. This is a scripture in Isaiah 43, verse one. Here's the prophet of the Lord. Here's what he says. But now, O Jacob, and whenever God speaks to the Israelites and call them by their forefathers' previous name, he's specifically Joshua speaking to the 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 uh, the old man. The humanity that fights against the divinity in your life. I'm going to share something with you. You will never in your own mind be perfect or complete enough to do what God calls you to do. On Thursday night, uh, uh, I I have a daughter in the Lord. Some of you may have seen it on social media. Uh, She called me and she said, hey, you have a minute? I said, sure. She said, I just got a call and they considered me to be a judge. I said, what's going on? She said, well, the judge is retiring and, and I'm, going, I'm headed to the governor's office right now for a meeting. And the spirit of the Lord fell upon me. And me and her began to reason out what this looks like. How, and I said, this is the Lord. It's the Lord's doing. You know what I love about her? She listened to the word of the Lord and she said, I agree. I agree. I, her own, I agree. I agree. She did not get in the way. She had no doubt. She did not disqualify herself. And then she said, I said, I said to her, all that you've been through up to this point was to prepare you for this. God will baptize you in failure before he releases you to purpose. 
He will, listen, he will allow you to suffer such pain and such a loss and you wonder where is God and the whole time he is there tempering the trial to make sure it gets the spots it needs to get. He needs to get the pride out. He needs to get all of the, all of the, the self-evaluation and all the introspection that is serving no purpose out of the way. Why? Because he has called you to do a certain thing and God knows exactly what you, who you need to be for the moment. In Isaiah 43, he says, but now, O Jacob, listen to the God who created you. Listen, here's the language. Listen to the God who created you. I made you. Your personality came from me. Your, your sense of humor came from me. God laughs. Your, your, your mentality, your emotional disposition, your perspective. You know what's funny? People say, I just wish that you just loosen up. Loosen up. I'm, I'm telling you right now, this is loose as it's going to get. You need to understand something. <laughs> You, you don't understand how God made me. You, my son was telling his church yesterday, he said, my dad, he said, I used to leave for school in the morning, come back from school, go to bed at night. He said, my dad is in the same position with 15 Bibles around him. Do you know what it takes? I don't know anybody else that would, could do that. That's the way God made me. God made me to, when, once something gets in my eyes, I go after it till I find it. That's the way I'm designed. When it comes to, now, I love to see worship and praise. My, when, whenever God comes in the room, I go inward. Why? Because that's where he is in me. I, I go into the secret place. Where's the secret place? It's inside of me. And whenever you, the, the, the room is high and you see me standing there, you see me bowing, I'm with the Lord. When you're running, you're with the Lord. You do you. Do you. That's how God created you. But I'm going to show you something. We cannot try to force each other to be who we are. Because, because, because God made us different for a reason. Because his army, his army. And so in the making, I want to end today. God, that time is so, turn the clock around. So, so watch this. I want to leave you with the making of a soldier. Who needs to hear this? The making of a soul. I'm going to tell you why. You've been going through the guy with, right here. You've been going through. And I'm going to tell you something. Yeah, I'm talking to you. You're in the black mask. Yeah, you've been going through. And you've been wondering, what in the world? I'm going to tell you what's going on. God is forming you. He's shaping you. You got it? And sometimes it makes you want to give up. It makes you want to quit on God. And he won't let you. He won't let you. You know why? Because you got more work to do. And the way God makes a soldier is he takes you to three different types of tests that seem to be an escalation from the, the previous one. Here's what the prophet said. Here's what he said. He said, but now, O Jacob, listen to the Lord who created you. I made you. He said, and Israel, the one who formed you. Notice what he said. I, he said, I created Jacob, but I formed Israel. The difference, if you look at the Hebrew words, the difference between creation and forming is that creation is something that God does, for example, uh, uh, out of the womb. You're created by God. God could create you, sin could deform you, and he has to now transform you. But that's the order of God. There's no one that breaks the matrix. You don't come out of your mother and come into a sinless situation. So God, what God does, God actually uh, plans for the impact of sin on you, and he uses all of this to shape. He's going to make a soul. Watch this. He said, he said, I want you to listen to me. Listen to me, Jacob, who, uh, the Lord who created you, and Israel, the one who formed you, says, don't be afraid. For I have ransomed you. Ransomed you. The enemy told you, you should die because you're messed up. You should be disqualified because you're jacked up. But God said, I ransomed you. When you did, the Bible says a man is holden by the cords of his sin. Proverbs chapter 5. Translation, every time you do something wrong, you put handcuffs on. And because sin is so prolific, God says, I am committed that every single time you get in trouble, I'm coming to get you. The price is paid. I overpaid for your deliverance. In other words, your deliverance don't happen each time you get in trouble. It's already settled. You're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bring you out. 
Watch this. He said, I've, I, he said I'm the God that ransoms you. And he goes, here's what he goes on to say. He said, I have called you by my name. When you marry a woman, she takes your name. Now she becomes your responsibility. There's a lot of, a lot of responsibility. This person is my anything. If she's your, my wife or my child, you are responsible. That's a big task. There's a lot of stuff that God says, I've called you by my name or by, my, by name. You are mine. And that's what God said. Everybody say, I am his. I am. And he said, you are mine. And here's what he says. When, not if, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. I am your Savior. That word, Savior. I'm going to touch the rest of this. That clock doesn't lie enough. Cut it off. Let me show you something. Savior. It means the one that delivers you and the one that defends you. So let me take, I want to give you these three things real quickly and we're done today for what the Lord says. You're going to experience rising waters, rushing rivers, and raging fires. You're going to experience rising waters, rushing rivers, and raging fires. These are the three components that God used to make a soldier. When you go through, he says, and I wish I could get it from the King James Bible. I want, the New Living Translation is so pretty and beautiful, but the King James says, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Let me show you this. You said, what? He said, Pastor, what are these prophetic images? Every prophet needs to understand this. All the prophets in the house, perk up your ears. You meet people on the course of their journey they're either going through this issue of dealing with rising waters uh-huh. or they're dealing with rivers that are overflowing their banks or they're dealing with fire that is so hot it's uncomfortable. Let me describe for you what each one is. My mother, softly great. My mother was in the first stages of dementia. When I was a little boy, my mother and father were in a tension relationship. And by the time I was old enough to understand anything, there was a, a problem concerning me. I didn't know what it was. That it was between them. They never talked to me about it. But I always would be in the middle of stuff, and it was so discouraging because I loved them both so much, but they didn't love each other. And so my mother would protect. She just literally put herself between me and my father when he was in a rage. She was my protector. My aunt called me and she said, I need you to fly out here real quickly. Something happened. I said, what, what's going on? She said, she's fine, but your mother was in an accident. I rushed. i never forget. It was Mother's Day of 2013. I rushed out to San Francisco, and there she was in the hospital. I sat next to her bed. She knew me immediately. I said, hey, how are you doing? And she goes, hey, doctor, how are you doing? I said, I'm good. What happened? And she said, I don't know. But something was different about her. I don't know. So I went to the doctor and said, what's going on with her? And the doctor said, either she had a seizure because of the accident or she had an accident because of the seizure we don't know yet. So they discharged her after three days. I took her to her house. After I took her to her house, come on, thing, don't do this. After I took her to her house, she was waving goodbye, but something was different about it. I slammed on the brakes of the rental car, and I, I, I said, pack your stuff, you're going with me. I had to. Something was wrong. She wasn't the same person. I brought her home with me, and she was diagnosed. She was having a a series of mini seizures. She was having at least five seizures per per hour. Just mini, just shooting off. Took her to the hospital several times, and I watched her steady decline until she someday she didn't know who I was. And when I realized she she wasn't quite remembering, when my siblings would come to visit. She just looked at them. I could see the fear in her eyes, and I sat next to her. When they would be doing their thing, I said, that one is Leonard, and that's Laura, and that's Lorna. That, these are your children. And she goes, okay. And my heart was breaking. And I would get before the Lord, and I'd cry out to God. I said, God, do something. And it got worse. The, the, the water was rising. 
And I said, bring me out, get, deliver me from this. And it kept rising. And it kept rising. And one day she hauled off. And whatever I said to her, she thought I was my dad. And she punched me square in the... I mean, if that's what she felt about him, she punched the fire out of me. I'm talking about... I didn't, she, she got a good right cross. I mean, got me... I didn't even expect it. Bam! And I, I remember I took her by the shoulder. And I, I just responded. I said, if you were somebody else, I would knock you up. <laughs> and she looked at me. And she, in her, she had fire in her eyes. And I went to my room, and, and she comes over to the room. She says, I'm so sorry. And I was like, God. I, 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 it's okay. I kissed her. Got her settled. Came back to the room. I'm crying out to God. I said, God. And the water's rising. Water's rising. It got to the place where I, was, I, said, I felt like I was on my tippy toes. And it kept rising. And finally, finally my sibling says, we need to take her off your hands. But by the time she left... She thought I was somebody else, so I had to call for the helicopter and go for a flight. And when I came back, she was gone. And my heart shifted, and I went to the Word of God, and God says to me, he says, when you, when, he says, when you go through the waters, I will be with you. And he gave me the revelation of this thing, and that's how I saw it. God has you in a situation right now where the waters are rising. You're praying, but it's getting worse. Who am I talking to? It's, it, it's, now, you've been in it so long, you feel like you're on your tippy toes, and you can't get out of it? Huh? Who am I talking to? I'm, I'm, yeah. The reason he's not going to bring you out of that is because he says, I'm with you. You're going to learn things about me. You know what it did to me? It stretched my heart. It made me super patient. I got to the place where now I could sit with believers and watch them struggle and not at all be offended or bothered. What happens to them doesn't change my love. Why? Because I sat with my mother, the person who loved me the most, and watched her go into decline until my heart was so broken and I was confused. With God. Now I can say to the Lord, I know you love me in spite of what's happening. Rising waters speak to the fact that God will leave you in and not bring you out, but he will stay there with you. The second scripture, the second part of the verse says, he says, uh, when you go through rivers, they will not over, overflow. What does this mean? There are times that God will call you to transition. Imagine a river. Remember the Jordan River? When Israel crossed the Jordan River, it was overflowing its banks. God told Joshua, you got to lead Israel across the river, though it's overflowing its banks. Can you imagine you standing on this side of the river and you're called to that side of the river? Some of you right now, in a, or you're in a transition and you don't know how you're going to get across. You don't have the money, you don't have what you need, you don't have the connections, and you don't, how, I'm a, how will I get over there? And the Lord says, when you go through rushing rivers, the, you, listen, the footing alone, what do you do? He told Israel, let the priests go in first with the, ark, with the presence of the Lord. Follow the, you stay a football or field distance, and then you do what they do. God said, I'm going to take, I'm going to send my presence before you. You follow my presence into, the, into this turmoil of transition. Who am I talking to you in transition right now? And it's, it seems like hell is breaking loose. But watch this. You can't turn around because you're, you're, what you're looking for is on the other side. What you're called to is on the other side. Yeah. That's, that's the rushing. When you, God says when you go through when, uh, rising waters, rushing rivers, he said, you won't drown. You, Hear the word of the Lord. You're not going to drown. It looks like it. It's go, this gonna go, no, it won't go over your head. What's going to happen is God's going to teach you how to swim in rough waters. You're going you're gonna to learn how to deal with difficult people, difficult situations, how to make do with not enough money. God's going to show you how to get things done. Watch this. And God is not looking for change. Transformation is different from change. If God just wanted to change you, you'd be in the rising waters. When God wants to transform you, which is different. A, a, a caterpillar goes in to, uh, to its cocoon. Thank you. It's actually not a cocoon. It's a vulva, is it what it's called? Where the deep people at? Huh? The chrysalis. Bless the Lord. When a caterpillar goes into the chrysalis, it never comes out of caterpillar again. Because the idea is not change. It's transformation. It's transformation. And so when, you, when God calls you to rushing rivers, he's looking for transformation. He's taking you something, watch this, that you have to lean on him. And then the third thing, I'm done. Raging fires. Sometimes who we are and where we're going, 
and what's necessary, the polish that you need, the refinement that you need can't happen in water. So the Lord has been working on you. He's been beating on your life. He's been shaping you. He's been putting jewels and things in you. And now it's time for the fire. He's forming you in Pardo's wheel, a vessel, and then the vessel is marred in his hand, so he breaks it down. He builds you up again, and everybody's looking at your life. They want you to fail. They, they already put your name out there, and he now shapes you. And God says, this is exactly what I want. There's only one thing left to do. Put it through the fire. When God chooses the fire for you, is anybody here going through fire right now? When God chooses fire for you, it means that what he has just made is beautiful in his eyes and he wants it to be permanent. And the only way to make it permanent is to put it through the fire. Yeah. When, a, when, a, when, a, when a potter yes. shapes a vessel and gets what he wants, he puts it in the furnace. And you know what a potter told me? The potter said, I said, well, how long do you leave it in there? And you know what he says? Till it sings. I said, what? He said, yes. He said, well, I leave it in the fire till it starts to sing. I said, how do you mean sing? He said, it makes a sound. He said, it starts like a whistle. And he said, then it develops its own melody in the fire. That tells me it's time to get it out. You are in the fire right now, and you're not coming out till you learn to sing. There is a song that's going to come forth from your transformation in this fire and only the Spirit of God come on here. Only the Spirit of God in you, working with you, can bring forth the song that, the, that will tell the Lord, she's ready. He's ready. It's time. And if you try to force your way, finagle your way, rush a platform, start your own thing, don't worry about it. That's what happened. While you're doing your thing, you're going to still be in the fire. When God puts you in the fire, you can't escape it until he said it's over because he's, he's your God. 